You're watching in the studio at Davis Media Access, the virtual studio, as it were. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault. Dr. Amy Sisson joins me today. She is the health officer for Yolo County. She began this position in October 2020 at peak pandemic, and it's been my pleasure to interview her several times over the past few years. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Autumn. So today we're actually gonna talk about things other than COVID-19, but before we do that, I kind of wanna cap off this, this amazing period we've all weathered together. The first time I interviewed you was just after you joined Yolo County and also just before the first COVID-19 vaccines rolled out, which was in uh, December, 2020. And so we were talking then about things like social distancing and hand washing and masking mandates. I'm really curious as you think back on the legacy of this winter where we had the triple threat of COVID-19, RSV and influenza. What do we need to know about the risks still posed by COVID here in Yolo County? And what can you tell us about future boosters? I know, I know there's one being released and recommended for folks over 65. So what can you tell us? Yeah, well, certainly COVID has not gone away. Um, we've we've seen it um, since 2020, and it continues to cause disease here in Yolo County. The good news is that the newer variants, all of these Omicron variants that we've been seeing really since the end of 2022 are causing less severe disease. Fewer people are ending up in the hospital. Fewer people are, are dying. But COVID is still here and it will stay with us. And so we do every winter now run this risk of that triple demic of having what we call co-circulation of these three major winter respiratory viruses, RSV, COVID-19, and, and influenza. So we expect that to remain the case. Um, the CDC has now changed its vaccination strategy strategy for the United States, shifting from boosters to really just referring to an annual COVID vaccine. Um, so that is what we will we see this, this fall, likely along with our seasonal influenza vaccines, uh, there will be a COVID-19 vaccine. And instead of calling it bo a booster, we're just calling it an annual vaccine. Right. So as we've gotten our flu shot every year, for those of us who do that, we'll just get our, our COVID um, uh, immunization as well um that's the plan something... but of course with with COVID-19 we know there can always be surprises um so we may have a plan but we have to be ready to adapt as the virus adapts right and and for one there's there's kind of a lasting behavioral change I know that these days when I go to events or I go to meetings there's always a, a, you know, it's a kind of a small portion, but there's always a portion of people who choose to remain masked. And I think that's a behavioral change to, that is just here to stay, it seems. I All right. Um, let's get into some of the other public health issues that may have arisen during this time. The, the first one I want to bring up is measles. It, it was shocking a few months ago to read about measles. I know it wasn't, it was never eradicated worldwide, but we really thought it was long eradicated here. Um, and then to have it begin showing up locally. So what can you tell us about risk factors and transmission for measles for those of us here in Yolo County? Yeah, and I'll start with a, a little bit of history because this isn't the first time that we're seeing measles in, in California in, in relatively recent history. There was an outbreak in 2015. There was another outbreak in, in 2019. Um, in the end of 2023 and now 2024, we've California has had six measles cases in, in 2024, all of which have been associated with people who have traveled internationally. Um, but that's in the, the first five, well, four months of 2024, we've seen six cases compared to last year when the entire year, all of California only had four cases. So this is definitely an increase from what we would expect as kind of our normal background measles. And it's really due to a decrease in vaccinations against measles worldwide during the COVID-19 emergency when people had less access to their regular healthcare providers and right. weren't keeping up with routine, routine vaccinations, as you already mentioned. Um, 
And this is especially true internationally. In Yolo County, we still have a very highly vaccinated population against measles. Um, we may have a, a few small pockets in communities where we see less vaccination. Um, for example, in schools where we may have more medical exemptions. Um, for, for students. So those pockets are concerning, but overall Yolo County um, youth especially have a very high vaccination rate. Um, however, other parts of the world do not have such high vaccination rates. And when our residents who may not be fully vaccinated travel out of the country to an area with more measles, then they run the risk of coming back with measles. And one of the things that's really important for people is to make sure that they're fully vaccinated before they're traveling. Here in the United States, um, you're considered fully vaccinated if you have two doses of a measles containing vaccine, which is typically MMR, mumps, measles, and rubella. We usually give that at 12 months and then a second dose at um, four to six years old. Um, so that would mm -hmm. mean that an infant who's less than one has not been vaccinated, ha doesn't have protection against measles. Um, and so we actually recommend in that instance that that infant gets another vaccine um, or gets a vaccine early, I should say. So after six months and between 12 months, they can get that vaccine, their first vaccine. It won't count towards their lifetime two doses, but it will mm -hmm. give them protection during their international travel. And similarly okay. for kids who haven't hit that four to six year milestone yet, um, they can get a second vaccine quote unquote early before their fourth birthday and that will count towards their two lifetime vaccines um, so that's what we're recommending for yolo county residents who are pursuing international travel particularly with the upcoming summer summer vacation when we might be seeing more measles <laughs> coming back into california and so asking uh, members of our community to check in with their healthcare provider, check their vaccine records, make sure that they and their children have two doses of vaccine before they travel into areas where they might be bringing measles home. Okay, good advice. Something else that was on my mind this winter was West Nile virus, um, largely because I'm a, um, I have a dog and I frequently go to parks with said dog and the mosquitoes were incredibly thick and very bitey this, this winter into early spring. Um, what are our case statistics here in Yolo County? And again, with this and uh, this disease, what should we know about our risk factors and transmission? Yeah, so a couple different things there. Let me start by talking about the, the mosquitoes. West Nile virus is transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito. Um, and it's a, a sp particular species of, of mosquito, the, the Culex mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus. The Culex mosquitoes are not the only species of mosquito that we have here in Yolo County in the greater Sacramento area. We also have Anopheles mosquitoes, which are typically associated with our, our rice fields. Um, and so my understanding in talking to our Sacramento and Yolo vector control partners is that the mosquitoes that we were seeing this winter that were so bitey, <laughs> those were our Anopheles <laughs> mosquitoes coming out of, of the rice fields after harvest. Um, and so they would not be capable of transmitting West Nile virus disease. They are um, incidentally capable of transmitting malaria, but we don't have <laughs> malaria uh, here in, in California. We, we occasionally get return travelers who test positive for malaria, um, but in general, it's not, it's not a concern for malaria transmission by our Anopheles mosquitoes. So relatively um, low risk for those mosquitoes that you are seeing over the winter in terms of West Nile virus transmission. Um, West Nile virus, typically the, the season is starting in May or June and continuing through October. Last year, we had a particularly bad West Nile virus season because our mosquito counts were really high um, and we saw more cases than we had seen in a long time. And we also saw two deaths from West Nile virus, which were the first deaths that we'd seen in Yolo County since 2019. And that was particularly tragic. And so our, we've looked back at our opportunities as a health department to, to intervene and to put out more messaging in terms of West Nile virus prevention. Again, it's transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito. So the way you can prevent 
uh, acquiring West Nile virus is to avoid mosquito bites. Um, so encouraging people if they're going to be active at dawn and dusk, outdoors at dawn and dusk when the mosquitoes are most active, we want them to be um, covering their skin with clothing as much as possible, long sleeves, long pants, and putting mosquito repellent on any areas of skin that aren't covered with, with clothing. Um, so that's our recommendation during quote unquote West Nile virus season. We haven't right. officially entered West Nile virus season this year. Um, we're waiting to hear our mosquito and vector control colleagues are doing surveillance. They will let us know when they detect the first West Nile virus positive mosquito. And that's when the health department will begin our communication about the importance of prevention of mosquito bites. And one of the things that we were able to add last year, which we're really excited about, is to put mosquito repellent in our vending machines uh, that originally just had COVID-19 tests and, and masks. And now we're expanding those contents uh, and products offered into other disease prevention areas, including West Nile right. virus with the mosquito right. repellent. So that will be showing up in a vending machine near you very soon. And we're, we're going to talk about those vending machines a little bit more. I'm, I'm glad to know I wasn't at risk all winter for West Nile virus, just the pain and suffering. I am one of those people mosquitoes love. So just many bites, but, but no real danger. While we're on the subject of transmissible diseases with odd names, highly pathogenic avian influenza, bird flu, and cows. Tell us more. Yeah, this has been been getting a fair amount of attention in the media over the last couple of weeks. It actually, the, this outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza began worldwide in, in 2021. Um, it, is a, it is a funny name, it's, it's bird flu. And when it started out in 2021 and then came to the United States in 2022, it was in wild birds. Um, so it was an appropriate name. And then it, it moved from wild birds into our domestic poultry or chickens. Um, and it still made sense to be called avian influenza. And then recently we've seen, it's the same virus. So I understand right. why it's called avian influenza, but it's now causing disease in dairy cattle in eight states, I believe on 33 farms across those eight states. It does not include California at this point. Um, so it's now a disease in, in cattle, and we've seen over, since 2022 that there have been two cases in humans. The, the first case in 2022 was in a poultry worker who was exposed to sick chickens. And then this most recent case at the beginning of, of April is in a dairy worker in Texas who was exposed to sick cattle. Um, so we're still calling it avian influenza, but it's causing disease in cattle, particularly dairy cattle. They seem to be uh, most affected in their mammary glands, which is affecting their milk production. Um, so the federal government and the state governments are following this very closely um, now that it's moved from chickens into mammals, not just cows, um, but we've seen it in raccoons and skunks and in seals and in bears and many other wild animals. But now we're seeing it in domestic mammals, including cows. And with these, you know, this one sporadic human case, uh, keeping our eyes open to make sure that there aren't more human cases, which could be signaling that the, the virus is becoming more adapted to, to humans. Um, so the, the federal and state governments are continuing to keep a close eye, close eye on that. One of the things yeah. um, that people have asked questions about is the safety of the milk supply. If these are dairy cows who are infected, um, and their milk is potentially going into commercial production, production, is there a risk of drinking milk and getting right. avian influenza or bird flu? And the answer there at this point is no. Um, while the, the FDA routinely tests the milk supply and they've gone into the milk supply in the areas around uh, where the farms had sick dairy cows, and they have in fact seen um, fragments of RNA from the avian influenza virus in, in the milk supply. But all commercial milk in the United States is, is pasteurized. And so that pasteurization process kills the virus. And so it's normal um, 
well, not normal, but the virus that's in the milk is actually a killed virus. They haven't been able to grow it in, in a laboratory because it's been mm -hmm. killed by the pasteurization product. So they're just seeing the DNA. Uh, so it's not an infectious virus. Um, so if people have concerns about the, the safety of milk at, at this point, um, and there, there are still lots of tests and lots of questions being being answered and, and asked about milk and cattle and transmission between cattle and transmission between humans. But at this point, um, everything that the studies have shown is that the milk supply is safe right now. Okay, good. That's good information so stay because tuned. You know, people will yeah, people will will hear this on the news and and wonder, you know, what's happening in, in Yolo County. This is why I like to talk to you so much about this stuff. Um, before we circle back to those those vending machines, let's talk about um, uh, sexually transmitted infections in, in Yolo County. How how are we doing and, and how do we stack up statewide, I guess? Yeah, thanks for that question. This is something that we don't talk a lot about, um, but we are seeing an increase in sexually transmitted infections in Yolo County and in California, primarily among syphilis and, and gonorrhea, not so much on the chlamydia side, which is uh, the, the third sexually transmitted infection that we do, we do follow and is reported to public health. Um, Yolo County compared to California overall, it has a below average rate of these sexually transmitted infections. And it's below the national average as well, but it's still been increasing. So it's heading in the wrong direction um, really since before the pandemic began and continuing to, to increase during the pandemic. We're particularly concerned about syphilis, um, especially the, the large rise that we've seen in syphilis cases in, in women and then syphilis cases um, in newborns, uh, transmission from the pregnant person to the um, fetus in, in the womb, and then the fetus is born um, with congenital syphilis, which of course could have been prevented if syphilis in the, the birthing parent had been detected and treated. Um, we actually have a syphilis task force here in Yolo County that was started pre COVID-19 pandemic and kind of got put on pause while everybody's focus was sure. on COVID-19. And now we've relaunched that task force with partners across healthcare, public health, um, homeless services and other social services, um, really trying to wrap around pregnant persons, get them screened for, for syphilis, uh, which involves testing and then treating them um, and making sure they don't get reinfected. So treating their partners as well, um, either before or during pregnancy to prevent you know, the tragic case of congenital syphilis, which can end in stillbirth or uh, a, a death of the infant shortly after birth. So we really wanna avoid that situation, but we have seen an increase in, in congenital syphilis cases, which is why that is our syphilis task force initial focus. Um, and we also have, you know, some some efforts with our vending machines, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute, to add some products related to prevention of right. of sexually transmitted illnesses. Right, you know, syphilis is. You you read stories like you know from from hundreds of years ago where where syphilis is is a theme, and it's a very persistent um, disease or infection if it's still around in in this this uh, quantity these days. Um, that's kind of hard to hear. All right, let's talk about those vending machines because I want to end on kind of a fun note. Um, I believe it was in uh, 2022 that the county, uh, that summer, the county installed the first of vending uh, vending machines. And um, so let's let's talk about how many there are, where we can find them. And then I know they were originally intended to dispense uh, COVID-19 test. And uh, from our, our offline conversation, there's kind of an array of products now. So um, how many, where can we find them and what's in them? Yeah, I love talking about our vending machines. I, I really appreciate the innovation of our, of our team in envisioning um, how a vending machine could become you know, a, a source of, of health and wellness products in a, in a community. And it really was spurred um, by the COVID-19 pandemic and really that transition 
um, from the widely available saliva-based PCR testing that we had available through Healthy YOLO together, um, which started right. as Healthy Davis together and then spread out to the entire county and, and was redubbed uh, Healthy YOLO together. But when that testing ended, needing to make sure that there was still a, you know, a good access to inexpensive or free um, testing for COVID-19. And so we had the idea of, you know, we borrowed this idea from college campuses where we had seen um, COVID-19 tests available to students if they swiped their ID card. And we thought, why not take this beyond a college campus and bring this to right. the community? And we were getting free COVID tests from the, the state health department. Um, so all we had to do was purchase the vending machines with some of our, our COVID money. Um, and voila, we had free 24 seven access to COVID testing. And we eventually added masks, high quality masks as, as well. But really the initial focus of our five vending machines was COVID-19 prevention. And when we got out of the COVID emergency phase, we yeah. were starting to think about, okay, there's less demand for the um, COVID products. We want to keep stocking some of them, but we don't need to fill every single, you know, shelf and every single row right. of coils in the vending machine with um, COVID tests and masks. And so we started thinking like, what else could we use these machines for? And so we broadened our perspective, um, expanded to other infectious diseases, and then also um, we're, we'll be adding oral hydration solution, water bottles. Uh, this summer, we're hoping to have clean socks available in there um, in the future. But um, we've recently, or relatively recently added um, condoms, internal and external condoms, as well as lubricant. Uh, we've added emergency contraception. Uh, you might know it better as plan B. Uh, we have added fentanyl test kits for drug users to test their supply to see if it's contaminated with a fentanyl to then dose more safely. We'll soon be adding naloxone for treatment of opioid overdoses. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else is coming soon. Uh, like I said, the, the water bottles and, and socks or something. And then we're going to start restocking mosquito repellent, as I talked about before. Um, you asked where the vending machines are. Um, yeah. As I said, we have five in, in Yolo County. We've tried to cover um, most of our population centers. So we have one in Woodland, which is in front of La Superior Market. We have one in West Sacramento, which is at our Health and Human Services Agency building. Um, that one is indoors. Um, we have one in Esparto at the library. We have one in Davis, which is at, currently at the Mary Stevens Library, but will likely be re relocating it soon to our Health and Human Services Agency um, campus in Davis. And then we also have one in Winters, which is at City Hall. Thank you. Yolo County Public Health under your um, leadership has been nothing but innovative during a time that that really demanded innovation and excellence from all of us from, you know, Healthy Davis together, as you as you mentioned, turned into Healthy Yolo together. And then we had test to treat mobile centers. And now we have vending machines. So there's been a, a continued um, effort to really meet people where they are and to offer services that are not only um, useful, but readily available. So thank you for that. Well, thank, and, thank you. Um, and I would be, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to acknowledge that while I may be the public face of, of of public health in Yolo County that I don't work alone. We have a great team here at Yolo County Public Health who I am blessed to work with every day. They were recently recognized by the Board of Supervisors at, um, with a resolution honoring National Public Health Week and declaring the first week of, of April here in Yolo County to be Public Health Week. Um, and I'm just so grateful to work with such smart, committed, and as you pointed out, innovative people um, who make me look good. Um, but it's really their behind the scenes work um, that is really driving our health department. And so I just wanted to take a moment to, to thank them yeah. and you know appreciate what a challenge it has been for all of our staff navigating through the you know four hard years of, of pandemic and now beginning to 
um, sort of get our feet back under us in addressing other things, just like we're doing on, you know, this interview today, it's not all about COVID, which is nice, right. but that's also for a challenge for our team to, you know, be still addressing COVID and be doing all these other things. So I'm just really appreciative of, of how much, um, despite all the challenges that they've, they've stayed here with us and continue to be committed to the work of improving the health of people in Yolo County. So just really grateful for, you know, being with such dedicated people. Yeah, well said. And folks, it is always a team effort. That is just the truth. So um, Dr. Amy Sisson, thanks so much for joining me today in the studio. You've been watching this thanks through Davis me. Media Access. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault. And we appreciate you watching. Take care.